nine, eight, seven. We rolling. All right, welcome to the starboard portal. Today we have Dobbs Davis up, who is the communications director for the ORC, so the Offshore Racing Congress rule. And more importantly, Dobbs is a uh, general advocate for all measurement rules. Uh, my name is Nathan Titcomb. I'm the offshore director at US Sailing. I'll be monitoring the questions on the chat, so please keep them coming through and we'll have some Q&A at the end. But up for now, uh, Dobbs, please take it away. Well, thanks, Nathan, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Nathan uh, also forgot to mention, I'm a US Sailing Certified Measurer. <laughs> and we had a, uh, with Nathan's help, we had a, a, an awesome uh, measurement seminar here in Annapolis a month ago, uh, trying to fulfill our mission to, to get more people aware uh, of measurement-based rating rule systems and uh, creating the infrastructure for that. So thanks again, Nathan, for you and the team for, uh, and, and we, we, we just got by before the shutdown. So uh, we, we really got lucky having that, uh, having that event. Uh, so today, um, I know our, our promotional title was demystifying the rating rules. And I thought, well, something a little more clever might be, is it possible to have fair handicap ratings? Um, that's a, a real rhetorical question that uh, certainly uh, is, is, is discussed at length in bars, but uh, we're, we're gonna try to touch on some of those subjects here today. Um, and let me see if I hope everybody can, uh, can see the screen and, uh, put up with my thick fingers and in, in the uh, various controls. Um, the premise here is that we'd love to be racing one designs. Everybody likes close competition. And when you're in the same boat, uh, that's awesome. And you can focus on the nuances, not worry about the equipment so much. Uh, you, the usual saws, uh, apply where, uh, the uh, <clears throat> software is more important than the hardware. In detail, of course, that isn't true, but uh, one design, and one design sailing is great. Um, but uh, we don't always have that option of, of one designs and not everybody wants to sail the same boats nor has that opportunity. So we need to come up with a system that can be fair across a variety of boat types. And, and you know, whether you're in small fleets or, or large ones like this, uh, having fair handicaps really helps everybody uh, get assured that it's worth it to go out and, and compete, that uh, you know, there's no biases in the rule and it's all, all right and fair. Now, um, handicap racing has gotten maybe a, uh, off and on a bad rap, uh, certainly probably since it's been invented, but uh, a couple of years ago at the US Sailing Leadership Forum in St. Petersburg, we had tried to identify a few issues that uh, seem to be uh, common in this, in this argument, um, you know, declining participation, what are the possible causes? Is it too expensive? Does it take too much time? Uh, there's a lot of maintenance hassle associated with big boat ownership. Uh, one is cruise, you know, inability to get um, a lot of people to sail. That's why we've seen a, an uptick in the uh, interest in double-handed and short-handed sailing. Uh, differences in lifestyle means the dem demographic shift uh, people like cruising more than they like racing. Uh, certainly we're seeing that in, in trending uh, with uh, distance races, whether they're short distances or long distances, uh, seem to be coming back in popularity versus the windward leeward buoy races. Um, is sailing too complex for the average sailor? Is the game out of reach? Uh, certainly that varies with, with whatever the context is. On the one hand, you got a lot of people who are really interested in sailing. It's an environmentally friendly sport. Um, but on the other hand, it, it, it is complex. There's a lot to learn. Uh, so, you know, how do we motivate people to come out there? Uh, not enough one design sailing. Uh, that's sometimes uh, think it brought in as a problem because sometimes one design sailings help spur uh, those interested in a variety of different boat types and coming out and racing. Um, sometimes too much one design sailing. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we see some of the trends that we've plotted here in, in the last uh, few decades. Um, another one, and that's why uh, is highlighted here, is unfair handicap ratings. Is there too much bias in the handicap system? Uh, 
Is it uh, favoring some boat types and not others? Uh, are there some inherent problems with that that discourage people from participating? But uh, regardless uh, of the effects, the uh, fleets seem to be declining. Um, you know, it's and with with declining fleets, you get other problems uh, where it's hard to organize classes when you've got a wide variety of boat types. Um, you know, certainly the, the fleets are more diverse than they were 20, 30 years ago. There's sport boats racing alongside cruiser racers. Uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty hard on a handicap system to make that fair. Um, and another one is, are there just too many rating rule options? Sometimes race organizers don't know what to write in their notice of race. You know, PHRF is a, is a widely uh, used system, but it has some inherent issues with it. Uh, it's another single number system is IRC, used ma mainly in the Northeast nowadays. Uh, and then two VPP-based systems, uh, ORR and, and ORC. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit on the history. Um, Nathan's been kind to share with me some statistics on uh, where rating rules have been historically. So this is a plot, I hope everybody can see it, uh, of what, uh, how many certificates were issued from the years 1987 all the way up through last year. Um, over here in the beginning of that time period, there was, as you can see by these numbers in the thousands, there were lots of IOR and, and then, and the uh, IOR is in blue here. It, it showed a steep decline here, but initially it was quite strong. It was a universal rule system. Uh, IMS kind of took that uh, away from IOR. So you, as you see this fall, you see this rise, but, but those are strong numbers and show that there was a pretty healthy measurement-based rule culture because both of these rule types rely on measurements and there were local measures in, in all areas of the US. Um, and then it started really to decline and decline fast in the late 90s, early uh, aughts. Uh, you can see the, the declining um, uh, numbers there for IMS. Um, in this uh, green graph here is where there was a, basically a, a uh, let's call it a political split <laughs> between uh, ORC who was managing IMS and, uh, and US sailing managing uh, a similar VPP based system called AmeriCap. Maricap, which morphed into being uh, ORR when, when the ORA took over uh, ownership of that system. Uh, that, that took a, a steep increase in, the, in this time period between 2003, 2007, because there was a general recognition here in the States that uh, a VPP based system is really important. Um, it's, it's, uh, we, we very much thank uh, the, that, that group for keeping measurement culture alive here in the States, because what was happening in this big saddle uh, that's not plotted, but, but the rise in popularity of offshore one designs really I think accounts for why we see these steep declines here. Um, a resurgence of, of use of the VPP based system was a recognition that, that we actually do need this, uh, even if it's in one design context when you're doing races like the Chicago Mac or the Bermuda race or the Transpac, uh, you're trying to rate uh, everybody across uh, all their different boat types and, and come up with winners. So to do that, a VPP based system is needed. We also have a, a plot here for IRC uh, that was introduced around 2004. Uh, it showed initial great uh, uh, enthusiasm and popularity, both in the East and West Coast, but has been steadily declining since. And then um, over here in the same color as, as IMS is, is ORC. ORC has uh, been reintroduced here in the States uh, just in the last few years. And with a, with a good positive trend here, uh, I think, again, that's, that's good news uh, for the US coming back to measurement-based uh, rule cultures. Now, in the background in this, uh, sorry, not in the background, but uh, kind of faded a little bit in color and with some pretty erratic numbers is, uh, is an estimation of the PHRF. Now, this uh, graph is mislabeled, by the way. This isn't times 10. It's more like times 25 uh, based on our vertical axis numbers here. Um, and and it's, uh, there's a caveat here because uh, as Nathan uh, could, could uh, reinforce, we, we just, PHRF is a local based system. It's not, uh, certificates are not issued by US sailing. So we don't have a lot of um, good data for what these, uh, what these numbers are. Uh, Nathan, I didn't know if you wanted to make a comment on that. Sure, Dobbs. The, uh, what we have here is that uh, U.S. sailing tracks the number of member fleets. So these are fleets who are members of U.S. sailing. 
Uh, and the way that we track them, we're not asking for them to send us their certificates or anything like that, but we are asking for a range of the number of boats that they have rated in their fleet. And that can be from zero to 100 or 1000 plus, et cetera, et cetera. So these are general range numbers, uh, but we can see the number of fleets and the size of those general fleets uh, in order to make this assumption on the numbers of PHRF boats. And is it, is it safe to say, Nathan, though, that uh, PHRF as well is, is undergoing a, a little bit of a decline in participation? Is that is that fair? That is a fair statement, correct. Now, one thing I didn't do, I, I mentioned this to Nathan when we talked earlier, is I didn't um, sum these plots. So take the measurement rules, sum them together. You know, we would get then a, a larger curve here. Also with this saddle that we're interpreting uh, in this time period is, is when one designs, new one designs were coming out, the MUM 30s and FAR 40s and one design 35s and so on. Um, and uh, as those one design fleets began to uh, taper off in their, in their one design only configuration and the second tier of boat owners were using them in local fleets, then, then they came back into the handicapping rules. But I think if we sum these uh, together, are, are, do you think the situation is more or less stabilized, Nathan? Are we in and around uh, a thousand or plus or minus um, in the current uh, sum of, of IRC, ORC and uh, ORR? Yes, for the last several years, we have seen about 1,000 to twelve to 1,500 certificates, depends on the year with the Bermuda race and that sort of thing. But we are in a stable situation where we've kind of plateaued at this point. I'll make just one comment. Uh, as everyone knows, Bermuda race is not running this year because of the pandemic. Um, and, and the seesaw pattern here of, of ORR is, is, I'm sure, related to Bermuda race years. Um, hopefully, that doesn't get affected too much. But you know, with a typical Bermuda race fleet, that's a lot of ORR certificates. Um, we're hoping with the growth of, of ORC uh, in local fleets and not pegged to specific races, we might still be able to maintain the uh, strong numbers. Is that, uh, what do you think, Nathan? I certainly hope that we'll be able to uh, maintain these strong numbers. Uh, certainly we're not in unprecedented times, but uh, I think we all want to get back on the water and people want to go racing. And uh, that's why I think most people are tuned in today. We all want to learn about this and be back on there and uh, wishing them for the, the, the better days ahead. And so uh, I'm optimistic that this is just going to be a blip for this year and we'll see these numbers back where they have been. Yeah, certainly it's going to depend a lot on timing. We still uh, haven't even really started the racing season here in the in the Northeast. Um, the West Coast has been going along for a little while and will continue to go along. And, and Florida has actually just finished their season um, and they had a strong one. And they, they uh, I guess, luckily um, end, ended their season uh, to coincide with, with the current uh, restrictions. But in any case, uh, this is an interesting plot. I thought uh, we'd spend a little time with it. Um, now I'm going to segue over into talking a little bit more on uh, the VPP-based systems because those are uh, our primary ones. Uh, IRC is a single number system and is based on measurements, um, but uh, I think with, with uh, this presentation we'll try to demonstrate how the VPP-based systems are, are just much more powerful in, in presenting some, some interesting options uh, available for, for both sailors and, and fleet managers and race, race directors. Um, basically, the way it works is through the uh, science of hydrodynamics and aerodynamics. Uh, we've got a balance of forces where the drag force that's uh, experienced by the appendages and the hulls in a, in a boat is balanced against the drive forces that are produced by the sails. Um, with gravity, healing force is uh, counteracted by the stability force. And, and these uh, VPPs are simply sophisticated equations that try to find the balances of these. The measurements that are used um, are then important because we have to quantify what those forces are. Uh, so whether it's the rig uh, and all the rig dimensions, the sails and the sail dimensions, uh, the propeller uh, as well as the appendages, propellers as you can imagine are, are significant drag forces. And then finally uh, over here on the right is, is, uh, is how we measure stability uh, by putting weight out at the end of the into the boom or a pole at a known distance, we can uh, then calculate the stability of the boat. These uh, inputs um, are then uh, used in the VPP to create uh, data such as you see here. Uh, this is a summary of, excuse me, uh, both uh, 
uh, the, the performance data predicted through six to 20 knots of wind through all these various wind angles. Um, <clears throat> and this is shown here in, in seconds per mile, or you can convert that easily over to, uh, to boat speed in knots. Um, this, is, uh, this is on a page, the first page of an ORCI certificate. There's a lot of real estate used here. So uh, only ORCI certificates show these because they're three pages long. Uh, club certificates have, uh, and then Nathan, remind me, uh, club certificate ha has a, an appendix with, uh, with polar data on it. Is that correct? The second page? That is correct. Yes. The U.S. Uh, issued club certificates do have an appendix with the polar data on there. Um, right. And I and think, remind me, is that, uh, uh, that's in boat speed or is that in seconds per mile? Um, seconds per mile, I believe. It is seconds per mile. Okay. Well, again, um, it's uh, easy enough to convert. Uh, there's 3,600 seconds in an hour, and uh, and you can easily uh, convert that over. <laughs> Simple math. Uh, in any case, with with these speed predictions, we can then um, go into ways of scoring races, whether they're windward lured races, where you've got a fairly uh, uh, short course. You know, windward lured races are typically an hour or two long. Uh, the dimensions of the course uh, can be measured, um, and uh, and using simple models, uh, we can come up with uh, scoring options available. Uh, or if you're going long distances, going all the way to Hawaii, how do you score that? Uh, again, this is going to rely on on course models for what the uh, variance of wind speed and wind angles are, um, and uh, with with that power in a VPP, we can attempt to get at some fair ratings. Um, the other uh, real virtue of, of, uh, of VPPs and measurements um, is that you can, relate, you can rate a wide variety of boats. So sport boats, race boats, you know, full race boats, uh, cruiser racers, super yachts, and even multi-hulls uh, can all be rated uh, using a VPP. Now, certainly the monohulls are gonna be using a different VPP than the multi-hulls, and uh, the devil's in the details on all this stuff. Um, but uh, in the ORC world, they, uh, they actually have a separated class for sport boats defined by 6.15 meter, no, it's 6.0 meters to 9.15 meters in length. So that's basically 20 feet to 31 feet in length. And they have to be uh, less than two tons in uh, weight and have uh, certain other parametric definitions of, uh, of what a sport boat is. Um, racing boats are defined, or they're called performance uh, in the performance class. Those are boats that don't have the minimum interior uh, needed that cruiser racers have. Uh, the size and, and uh, dimensions of their cockpits are also relevant criteria. Super yachts are anything over 30 meters. Um, ORC got into the super yacht game a few years ago and had to uh, revamp the VPP to be quite specialized for these very special yachts. And these are everything from, uh, to, uh, from sloops to catches uh, to uh, even schooners, sometimes square rig yachts. Uh, they're, they're absolutely spectacular and uh, absolutely difficult to, to rate. But uh, uh, the clever guys working uh, on that have found ways to do that and uh, introduce, again, through VPPs, a variety of scoring options to make racing fair against some of these wildly different boats. Um, the latest project that uh, ORC is working on is, is multi-hulls. Uh, as you can imagine, the, the performance uh, characteristics of multi-hulls are very different than monohulls. Um, they very much are sensitive to uh, course geometries and, and wind speeds. Um, but uh, along with help from Larry Rosenfeld at the Sailing Yacht Research Foundation and the uh, OMA, uh, the Offshore Multi-Hull Owners Association, they've uh, they've been working hard at, at trying to find an equitable way to to make a VPP for that. So with that um, and all those tools, you can condense that into some scoring options that are shown on every one of the uh, ORC certificates for monohulls. So sport boats, race boats, cruiser racers. Uh, we'll all have this simple scoring option box. Uh, we're going to step through a couple of examples of how to use this, which I think might be interesting. Um, oh, and then double-handed. Um, 
Double-handed certificates are interesting. Uh, everybody, I'm sure, in the audience knows that uh, there's been a big push recently uh, on double-handed sailing. Uh, a lot of that is because uh, it, it's popular. Double-handed racing is awesome. It's actually my favorite type. Uh, you can uh, minimize the number of crew. <laughs> um, that's a, a nice logistic uh, plus. And, um, and, and it's, it's all, of course, distance racing. No, you don't go around the buoys this way. But ORC developed a double-handed certificate that has a uh, 170 kilogram uh, default crew weight, which is 85 times two. The average person we think is around 85 kilos. Um, and uh, and it also has some specific scoring. It, this might be a little too hard to see, but uh, there's, there's a specific scoring models that relate to double-handed sailing. There's no windward lured uh, numbers here. Uh, there's, there's a coastal long distance uh, course model, uh, circular random, which is a mix of all wind angles um, and wind speeds, uh, predominantly upwind and predominantly downwind. Um, this was tested out the, for the first time in the uh, Fort Lauderdale Key West race. And again, uh, paying attention to the media the last couple of months, uh, there, there's been a lot, of, a lot uh, done by the guys at North in particular, because uh, Kenny Reed, uh, uh, was extolling the virtues of that along with Susie Leach and they, uh, they uh, uh, did well on their uh, Juno 3300 uh, sailing from Fort Lauderdale uh, to Key West. And they had a double-handed certificate and uh, uh, I think for that race we used the predominantly downwind course model because the weather for the 24 to 36 hours of that race was in fact in those angles. So with those ratings they could have tighter racing and um, and that worked out pretty well. Um, Nathan, tell us uh, if, if, while I'm on this topic, um, if you can tell us the policy that you, the U.S. sailing has on double-handed certificates. Anybody can get one uh, if they already have an ORC certificate. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Uh, so the general policy is is you get your ORC certificate, whether that's club or international, and then follow up for the request for the double-handed certificate, and we'll issue that uh, for you with uh, no no additional charge. That's great. Um, and again, what, what, once racing resumes here, I think we're going to see more and more use of these uh, double-handed certificates. Uh, they're one page. Uh, they're easy for organizers because, because they are one page. Uh, they have a brief sum. This looks very much like a club certificate, um, and, uh, but it has these different scoring options here. So uh, uh, we uh, will look forward to, to using them later in the season. I know here in Annapolis, the Annapolis Yacht Club has a uh, a second edition of their uh, double-handed race that they held for the first time last September. So hopefully by September, um, we can uh, do this again. Okay, um, how do we get an ORC club certificate? Uh, this is, uh, there are two tiers of certificates in the ORC system, just like ORR, um, where they have full measured and partial measured. Uh, ORC has club certificates uh, which are based either on declared data um, uh, or, or measured data when, when it's available and appropriate, um, or full measured ORCI certificates, uh, which, which require full measurements. Nathan, maybe uh, as, as the rating officer here in the US, um, you can speak a little bit about that and, and uh, what your criteria is for, for each one of those. Sure thing. Uh, so when it comes to fully measured versus partially measured certificates, the big thing to remember here is that uh, in both cases, we're requiring full uh, measured sale certificates. So we're looking for the largest of each type of sale. And now with ORC, we're also looking for any code zero type sales. And that's really a big nomenclature issue. Um, what we really mean is any spinnaker with a midwidth between uh, 75 percent and 85 percent. Uh, that's relative to the foot ratio. Um, when it comes to fully measured certificates, this means that everything on the boat is measured. We're either sending a guy up your mast like Dobbs, or hopefully we're measuring the mast on the ground and we're getting all those dimensions. Sending we're looking me at the, up the mast. Well, hopefully not, but you know, <laughs> I have a 17 year old son for that, Nathan. Exactly. Well, I'm <laughs> the one who goes up the mast sometimes when need be. Uh, so, but the point is, is that we're measuring everything from your mass dimensions to your propeller to the boat's stability. Uh, and we can go into that further, um, but as well as getting fr uh, freeboard measurements, which using the 3D model allows us to calculate the boat's displacements. Um, and essentially everything is measured. It takes a couple hours, uh, probably more like five hours 
um, but you get the absolute most accurate look of your boat's actual characteristics, and then the performance will be most reflective on the certificates. This might be a good time for me to switch over to, to this uh, club application. Uh, you can apply for a club certificate online. Let's see if that comes up. There we go. <clears throat> Is that visible to you, Nathan? Is this? You know, Dobbs, I've gotten a, or I'm noticing in the comments here, there's a couple of comments to see if we can maximize the screen that you're viewing, and then you can tab between them, hopefully. Is there any way to hit that one? Yeah. And see if that can give that a try. Yeah, if that'll work. All right. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, hopefully that's a little bit uh, more visible. Um, and here's the ORC website. <clears throat> it's a uh, fairly complicated. There's a lot of info here. Um, and I'll step through a, a couple of things that I wanted folks to know. Um, one of our principles at ORC, by the way, is, is it's a, a complex VPP based system. There's a lot of measurements as, as Nathan has mentioned, but uh, we, we have a fundamental principle of transparency. We publish everything. There's nothing that is secret. Uh, we, we don't believe in secrecy. We, we believe to, to open everything up because in that way we can um, be almost an open source uh, style of improving the system. If somebody, uh, if somebody has technical issues, uh, they notice something that uh, isn't right, um, we have feedback loops that, that help improve the system. And we can only do that when we have a level of transparency. Um, this is unlike most other rating systems. Um, so a lot of these drop down menus are related to the rules and how they work. Um, all the everything's published. In fact, um, I think we have the VPP uh, was, uh, I, I know that we just finished that. Yep, there it is. So just loaded this past weekend is all the documentation on how the VPP works. So if you're fond uh, of, of a little light reading and some partial differential equations, um, I invite you to, uh, to go have a look at this. Everything's downloadable in, in PDF format. Um, but coming back to uh, this tab rating, the, the ORC club certificate uh, is one that uh, you can apply for online. And, and, and the process is this. Um, this is an example of a club certificate here. Um, and and, the, and what, what it looks like, you can move the cursor around uh, while online and there's some uh, expl explanatory boxes that come up that uh, help describe what, what all these various things are. So the boat drawing, you know, how is it done? Uh, this, is, this is also not generic. This, this boat drawing is done to scale and has uh, all the rig measurements as, long, as well as the sail areas and, and a lot of the sail measurements as well. So that's a handy resource. Um, and then as you move the cursor past each of these boxes, you get more of these explanatory uh, explanatory boxes that come up. So that's a handy way to, to uh, uh, know your way around a certificate. Um, the online club application is here. And this is where you can, if you like. Now, Nathan, I know that uh, there's also a portal that you have with the US Sailing website through the UCS system to apply for a club certificate, correct? That is correct. There's a jot form that we use to capture some basic information about the boat, but then uh, my team will follow up with you to grab the sail dimensions and other things that are listed on this one. Um, but this is really good for figuring out what all the dimensions are on an ORC certificate or ORR for certificate for that matter. And, and just like the, uh, the uh, example club certificate, as you move the cursor around these input boxes, it tells you what, what these are. Now, Nathan and I know the uh, abbreviations for these things because we're kind of nerds and we, we deal with this all the time, um, but we wouldn't expect anybody else to, uh, to memorize um, what all these girth measurements are for the sales, uh, along with some of the, uh, some of the, the mass profile uh, abbreviations, um, the rig dimensions. I mean, these are, uh, the, but, but with the help of these explanatory boxes, this, this, this helps you. Uh, if you want to input this, uh, if you know what these are, even if you wanted to get this off of your PHRF certificate, go ahead and Im import the or input these um, is uh, if you know them. If you don't know them, leave them blank because at the end, oh, and then even propellers. So we've, 
we ask here for uh, what type of propeller do you have? Folding, solid, feathering, you know, two blades, three blades. Um, some people even have four blades, but uh, don't worry, we, we don't differentiate between three and four, four blade props. Um, you know, if you know what the shaft di uh, propeller diameter is, if you have no propeller, if you have a sport boat that has a uh, outboard engine that you pull up and race with, uh, that would be the no propeller field. But basically this, this form here captures most of what's, if not all of what's needed um, for an ORC club certificate. Uh, when you fill this out here in the US, it comes to us at ORC. Uh, we then pass it over to uh, uh, Nathan and his associate Rex uh, in their office. And uh, uh, they will, um, I, I don't know, may, maybe Nathan, you can explain uh, what sort of weighting you put on, on this uh, declared data versus what you have in your own database to, to confirm this. So the big things that we look at here is that uh, using our own database and the database that's on the ORC, we take a look for your specific boat class and we're looking for the lightest boat that's been measured. So we're not looking for a declaration or designer numbers. We're looking for the boats that have been measured. Uh, we choose the lightest boat that's been measured and we apply that with the stiffest writing moment that we can find. If we can't find any, then ORC has some tools that apply a, uh, an estimated writing moment. Uh, and we put that all in together and then use your sail dimensions and make sure that they fit the rig that you're uh, supplying. And if not, we follow up with sail makers yourself and other people to make sure that we have the best data available. Nathan, what happens when somebody kicks this little uh, button here for feet and pounds? Do we beat them mercilessly and remind them that, that we like metric units? <laughs> Um, you know, I don't really kick you mercilessly, but what we end up doing is we uh, convert that and all of our certificates are stored and produced in uh, metric values. Um, it helps us a little bit if you can provide that all in metric values to start, but uh, if you're not very good at the conversion, then uh, do what you're comfortable with and we'll convert it. Just whatever you do, please don't mix feet, pounds, inches, and metric all together because that's a, a very, very tangled web that we have to try and unweave. So if somebody's going off their PHRF certificate and, and the units are, uh, are English, um, the, you can still make use of this form. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this is a, an easy way to get into uh, an ORC club certificate. Uh, Nathan, uh, timelines um, on submitting this data along with sale measurements. Um, what's, your, what's your typical timeline? We aim for one week turnaround. Uh, hopefully it's a little better than that in most cases, but remember that as you get closer to races and you decide to enter the race on a, uh, a Thursday, you're not the only one that's entering the race for that weekend on that Thursday. And so it's very helpful if we can do longer than a week of submitting the data uh, to make sure that we have enough time to get this through. Yeah, and, and we're also trying to coach our, our, uh, our race management pals um, to write in their notices of race uh, adequate time uh, to, to get certificates, you know, a, a week out or two weeks out um, is, is really good. And, and we'd let them uh, remind everybody in their fleet. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're having this tutorial now, I think too, Nathan, is to, is to just remind everybody, hey, we, we could be shut down now, but uh, when things fire up, it's gonna be sometime in the sailing season and then there's gonna be a huge rush. <laughs> Uh, that's absolutely correct, Dobbs. And so my, my personal plea is that uh, my team is, while we're working from home, as you can see, we are fully capable, able, and uh, ready to issue certificates. So if you've got, find yourself with some downtime and want to go through this process, please do. And uh, we'll be able to get this out so that when we are back online and ready to go sailing, we can just get out there and, and have some fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh... I, I, I know that for myself, I've got a lot of folks here in the Chesapeake Bay area that are already going through this process. Uh, they're, they're using ORC tools for the even Wednesday night racing. And uh, that was all sp supposed to start on April 1st, um, but uh, that, that didn't happen. And, and uh, yeah, so when things break, um, it, it'll break fast and everybody wants to go sailing. There'll be some, certainly some pent up energy. Um, all right. so. This is uh, just wanted to walk you through this process on getting a certificate. <clears throat> um, maybe while I'm here, I'll also give uh, a little tour of this other system. Now, up here in the upper right corner of the website, whether you're on the home page um, or any other any other page, is uh, 
is the sailor services box. And, and this is another feature that's unique to the ORC system. Um, we, we not only have a principle of transparency, but we're lucky also to be a very large organization and, and funded well enough that we have our own programmer. Um, our, our pal Penny Addis in Greece uh, works, <laughs> works his butt off at uh, providing all these awesome tools that we have. <clears throat> um, and, and one of them is, is this, which is uh, this system where uh, we can have a look at the, uh, at the let's say the, the, the guts of the ORC system. Now I have my, my login. You can register for a login, by the way, this is all free. Just uh, you would hit, uh, where is it? Register, you hit that link right there. It just asks for your email address and uh, you hit submit and the system will send you a password. Unfortunately, we're not configured that you can make your own password, but uh, hopefully with these, uh, with these uh, browsers remembering these things, uh, you can uh, do as I do and just log in once and it remembers. Um, and this is a, a pretty clever online system. Uh, we have it translated into several languages if uh, English is not your primary language. Um, but this is the homepage for sailor services. And this is kind of the, uh, as I say, the, 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 the portal of the back end of this system. Um, what you can do with this is, is, is several clever things. One, one thing you want to note here is there's, what is that, 125,539 boat certificate records online. Uh, what this means is in our, in our database, we have uh, measurement records that go way back into the IMS era, back into the mid 80s. You can do uh, searches for, for boats that uh, were measured back then because they were all part of, of ORC's management of the IMS rule. So uh, there, there's, there's quite, a, quite a lot of boats here as well as those that uh, uh, since 2009 is when this system came up uh, have been issued certificates by different rating offices around the world and everything gets uploaded to the system. So um, we can start off uh, with a few features here. Um, let's see. Usually you start here with search for certificates. Um, this is where you can find any certificate, valid certificate that's been issued since 2009 and get a free copy. Um, maybe what I'll do. Nathan, does anybody in the audience want me to look up any particular boat? Uh, do we have any anyone uh, chomping at the bit here to see what their boat is or what their pal's boat is? And, and now's a great opportunity to have some audience interaction and let me know um, what, what you wanna find uh, and we'll see if there's a, an ORC certificate in the database and we can uh, use this tool to, to play around with it. You know, I don't see any specific ones at the moment. Um, okay. The there is a little bit of a delay we have to keep in mind. So the ah, okay. that request is coming in a little bit later. Um, well, cho choose one for me, Nathan. Uh, da, 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 da. J thirty five. No. <laughs> What's the reference? Uh, it's a there. There is no such thing as the most common boat type because there there just is such a huge variety. Um, but I'm trying to think of a boat that. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll use the one that I'm going to come up with when I come up uh, back to my PowerPoint. I'm not going to go by name, but I'm going to go with uh, a first 40.7. Now, one little trick when you're using this, this tool, um, here in the search uh, criteria, it's sometimes uh, boat types are listed with blanks, sometimes with dashes, uh, sometimes with slashes. Uh, so what uh, Paniatis has done is you put in a um, percentage sign between uh, the name of the boat type and its size or whatever the model name is, and we'll do a search. Now, these are just for US-based Beneteau 40.7s. Um, there are many here. Now, this is actually a good example because this shows in these records uh, boats that were measured for IMS. And so these are old IMS measurement records um, that uh, go back in time. Now they all say 2004, that's simply the date that these were uploaded into the system or here even 2002, that's not necessarily the date that these boats were, uh, were measured. Uh, and uh, some more recent ones that got ORC measurements. Now, um, 
I'm going to look at this one. This this uh, this was a certificate from 2017, a club certificate for uh, John Pika's boat, Cora Bantic. And that's that's a copy of the 2017 certificate. Now, if you notice, these are all um, watermarked with this invalid for racing stamp. Uh, you cannot present this to a race organizer as a valid certificate. It's simply a copy that is out of the system. Um, a few things to note, uh, this is a club certificate. So it's a, a subset of, of measured data and unmeasured data. For sure, the sales are measured. I happen to know based on the provenance of this particular boat uh, that it used to be um, uh, it, it, it did have in the past an IRC uh, certificate, so it had some parameters measured. And uh, Nathan, you'll confirm too that boats with IRC certificates can easily get club certificates. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And if it's been an endorsed IRC certificate, we'll make sure that we're using that appropriate displacement that's been measured. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and that's certainly, you know, what, what's the incentive for getting measured? Um, with production boats, particularly uh, uh, racer cruisers or cruiser racers, uh, there's often a quite big uh, delta or quite big variance in displacement. Um, you know, rigs and sails are more or less close to being the same, uh, but uh, but displacement can be uh, can be enormous. And um, particularly again, Benetos, J boats, boats that are cruiser racers, and the reason is simply that. That the interiors can vary. Um, this, the, sometimes the laminate schedules and the way the boats are built are somewhat different. Um, even boats that are so-called one designs, um, unless they've been really built to very exacting tolerances and standards, it's it's uh, it's uh, pretty tough to assume that they're all the same. So, as Nathan said, their criteria in looking at boats that haven't been uh, measured for displacement or weight, um, they'll use the lightest uh, lightest possible. Um, uh, figure that's in their database. <clears throat> Beneteau 40.7s are, are one of these boats, I believe. I don't know, a couple hundred kilos in variation, Nathan, somewhere in there. That sounds about reasonable, yes. Yeah, so boats of this size, and a couple hundred kilos, by the way, it, it is a measurable and, and uh, very big uh, rating difference, so there's incentive to, to get measured. In any case, uh, here's Corey Bantics. Now, this is a 2017 uh, certificate, so the, uh, the numbers and the ratings here represent the, what was in the 2017 VPP. We change the VPP every year. And the reason is uh, not to necessarily to sell new certificates, although that's good for business. Um, it's, it's more because the VPP itself changes uh, based on new science, uh, uh, new techniques that the, that, uh, the, the folks on the uh, International Technical Committee use to evaluate the hydrodynamic and, and aerodynamic uh, uh, forces in that VPP. So for example, uh, weekend before last, uh, ITC had a virtual meeting uh, amongst their members. And uh, uh, their members, by the way, include uh, top yacht designers from around the world. So Jason Kerr, Jim Schmicker from FAR, um, uh, Udo Rolex represented. Uh, we've got uh, Matteo Poli, a young designer from Italy. Um, we've got a, a real wealth of talent. We're very lucky to have that talent uh, working on that committee. A little bit as uh, foxes in the hen house, as, as you might think, but on the other hand, when they all work together, they all have the same goal, which is to make this VPP as fair as possible based on, on their knowledge of the science and uh, the most uh, uh, recent uh, uh, tools. So for example, in aero studies, uh, used to be wind tunnels were used. Now we're segueing over into use of uh, CFD programs. The same thing with the hydros. Used to be tank testing. Now it's CFD. So there's there's a, a lot of work and a lot of investment that ORC makes in, in the technical committee. And those improvements come every year. So therefore the VPP gets better every year, um, and therefore the certificates have to have to be better, or sorry, have to be reissued on each calendar year. Uh, Nathan, we try to get that to you in the, usually the first couple of weeks in January. Um, so usually it's, it's fairly safe to say you're able to run certificates starting mid to late January. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And they're valid for one year through December 31st. Um, even, uh, even, uh, fleets like Miami where their season goes from September through April, um, they, uh, get, 
they, they use their previous year certificates up until December. And then Nathan throws his switch uh, for January and issues them uh, new certificates when the VPP co comes available so that they can race uh, with the new VPP. And by the way, different ratings. Uh, that when, the, when the ratings change year to year, they're very, very small changes. Uh, it, it's done uh, intentionally that way. Even if the science may support a, a big shift in ratings, uh, political decisions are made to try to, to, to spread that out over several years so there's no disruption uh, in the rating deltas between boats. Uh, and the typical changes we see are in the order of usually less than half a percent. So um, anyway, so long-winded way of saying that this certificate uh, is a copy available, but it's, it's not valid, not only because it's just a copy, but also it's on the wrong year's uh, VPP. Now, if we um, take Corabantic and we wanna get a current year VPP, we can use this clever tool by hitting the plus button. And with the plus button, uh, the, that measurement data gets added to a virtual folder that I have in my account, uh, my My Boats folder. I can bring up the uh, measurements for Corabantic. Uh, and now I can either request a certificate by hitting this button uh, and uh, getting a, a valid 2020 certificate with the current measurements that are in there, or I hit this button and start playing the game of, of what ifs. So what if I wanna change, uh, like just looking through this, for example, um, crew weight. Uh, the owner has a declared crew weight of 700 kilos. What if I wanna change that to the default crew weight, which I think is, is heavier than 700 for this boat. Um, I wouldn't change anything here with freeboards and specific gravity because this could be measured data that came from a earlier certificate. Um, any of this stuff you don't want to change for sure. Uh, if it happens to have a different propeller, here's a way to do that. If, uh, if you want to go to the rig and you say, you know, um, what do we have here? We've got a spinnaker pole in this. In fact, I, I noticed on this boat, they have both asymmetric and symmetric spinnakers. Um, if you wanted to change over to only asymmetric spinnakers, you could take this field out completely. In fact, let me just see what happens here. Let's look at the sails. There's uh, both symmetric and asymmetric sails in here. So we could run a what if by seeing how the rating would change and how the performance would change. If we took out the SPL field, turned it to zero, um, Let's see, other rig dimensions are in here. Uh, I won't go through all these. It'll take too much time. Uh, and you can learn these from the club application. But, uh, but that's a simple one, SPL of Spinnaker Pole Link. Uh, let's see, we wanna change then where the tack point is for the spinnaker. Uh, that's either gonna be on, uh, actually, let me see, does this thing, Let's just say for sake of argument that we put a bowsprit on this boat. Uh, give me a J, Nathan. 4.6, 4.8, something a little bit beyond J. Well, here's J. 4.8 right. would be fine. Four, here's J here, 4.420. So that's, that spinnaker pole was, I believe, that length. If we say add a bowsprit to this and we want to go out uh, about... Uh, 40 centimeters off the bow and added that, we could uh, put that in that field. Um, now we're gonna go over to sales and we're gonna take, we're gonna make inactive this symmetric spinnaker. So now we're gonna run a test certificate with these few, you know, this doesn't have all the measurements. <laughs> it just has a mid girth and a length and a, and a foot length. It doesn't have the other girths here. Um, so this can still run though, right, Nathan? Or should we, uh, should we put a, a luff length in here? Um, that should run. Yeah, it'll run with some kind of default. It'll create um, a default. But, but ideally you, you really wanna know what these measurements are from your, your sale measurement certificates. Um, you also have the ability to, uh, if you had what's called a headsail set flying. Oh, here's another tick box. We want to make sure the symmetric spinnaker, uh, asymmetric spinnaker is flown only from the center line. If we had a spinnaker pole on there, you can fly the asymmetric spinnaker off the pole and square it back 
and that does trigger a rating uh, a rating change. Um, but uh, with this inventory of, of sale measurements here, you have the ability to add new sales by hitting a plus button here. So I could, I, if I had another mainsail, I wanted to test what the rating change was with a different mainsail, I could add that in here, turn the tick box off for active and inactive. So that's, uh, that's another way of running tests. Uh, same thing with headsails. If you had a non-overlapping headsail and had the dimensions for that, you could add this in this field. Um, this just looks like a smaller LP uh, Genoa. <clears throat> um, same thing with spinnakers. You could put different inventory spinnakers in here and simply tick the boxes on and off for how you want to run a test. Um, stability field tells me that this boat had been measured uh, because stability is inputted to the, to the certificate. Um, I wouldn't touch any of this <laughs> as a, as a non-measure. Uh, you don't want to mess with these fields. These have been uh, inputted uh, fr from measure, measurement data, so you don't want to change that at all. But, uh, but sales are fair game. Uh, rig is fair game. And now I'm going to save these changes. I might rename this as a test ASIM. And uh, save the changes. And now, uh, just to check that what I've done makes sense, I can kick that button that says get a drawing. And uh, there we are, a Beneteau 40.7 that has a asymmetric spinnaker, a little tiny small bowsprit. And um, Everything looks proportionally correct. We haven't made any input errors. So now we can run a test. Now, is this free? The answer is no, um, but it's not that expensive. Uh, we run on a credit system in the sailor services where if you click that button there, you can buy credits. I'm just, now I've got a lot of credits because I know people, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you can buy blocks of credits and it's uh, 10 credits to run a, a test certificate. Um, if you buy them singly, they're 14 euros or about 15 bucks. Um, if you buy them in bulk, there's a, a greater discount. But uh, basically it's, it's about 15 bucks to run a, a test certificate. You buy the credits with a credit card or PayPal. Um, and, uh, and that's a easy access. Um, other systems in their run of test certificates are a little bit more of a, a process and uh, takes longer. Um, but uh, this is one where it's self-serve. Uh, so if Nathan were to run, run a test for you, he could certainly do it. Um, but um, I, I imagine he'll want something for his valuable time. Right, Nathan? That's true. If uh, we have to run the test in the office, it's certainly more expensive than this. It depends on what we're looking at. But basically, if it's much to your advantage to create your account, sign in, buy a couple of credits and do this. Um, we're, I'll do it for you. I'll help walk you through it. I'll even help walk you through it without doing it for you. Um, but the, the end game is, is that this is a powerful tool, useful across many different systems and uh, something that uh, I would familiarize myself with if I was in anybody else's shoes. With, with all our free time now. Um, that, true. <laughs> uh, but, but you can see in less than a minute, we created a test certificate it comes up as a PDF and, uh, and here it is. And, and what you'd wanna do um, is, sorry, there we are. Just, now this is all watermarked as, as being a test. So you can't run away and use this for racing. Uh, uh, you know, our policy, uh, and Nathan, you can uh, remind me on this as well, is, is that uh, you can only race with a valid certificate. A boat can have only one valid certificate at a time. So if you make a change like this and want to use use that for racing, uh, you've got to contact Nathan to get a new certificate issued, correct? That is correct, yes. The only but, caveat that's new this year is that you can have your double-handed certificate and your regular certificate. Um, but the right. general idea is that you can only have one valid certificate at a time. If you like what you see as part of a test, we're going to need the validation of whatever it is, if it's a sales certificate. Um, meaning that you looked at a non-overlapping head sale versus a large overlapping head sale, we will need the new sale dimensions for whichever sale you're choosing. 
uh, but then we can issue that certificate for you. Right. <clears throat> and um, yes, and, that, and that's important to mention too, that you can have a double-handed certificate at the same time as a full crude certificate. So that way, depending on how you're racing, you can toggle back and forth. Um, so the, the folks, for example, racing in September here in Annapolis on the double-handed race can still have a valid certificate fully crude that they'll sail the next week uh, in, in a Wednesday night race. So, um, so that's, that's kind of a cool feature. Uh, yes, so there's a test certificate. Um, you would obviously save this, you'd look at it, uh, make some comparisons against uh, uh, what your other certificate look like and, and then just gauge what you think the, uh, the, the rating uh, uh, change was and, and what it's and how it's appropriate and whether or not it's, it's worth that change. So uh, I did want to walk everybody through um, that, that tool and how clever that is. Um, you can also do things like this. There's a speed guide, which is a set of polars uh, that are generated through the VPP. Uh, you can get one of those uh, generated and then it's, it gets sent to you by email to your, uh, your registered account. Those cost 40 credits and it's both in tabular as well as uh, graphic uh, graphic format. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and uh, burn some credits of, of my own. And uh, that's been, uh, that, that will be sent to me uh, according to this very soon. <laughs> so uh, we'll see how fast the electrons move for that. And then the other thing is um, if you're doing, excuse me, windward lured course racing, you can uh, use uh, target speeds. And these target speeds is another uh, output that looks simply at VMG sailing for upwind and downwind. It's, so it's only really for windward lures. And uh, that too can be uh, sent to your email address. And uh, that too is uh, uh, 10 credits. Now, to get either one of these, you need to run a certificate. You need to, to, uh, to, to have the VPP run uh, at least once so that uh, it knows then how to deal with these. Um, so what else? Uh, there's a couple of other cool features in the sailor services. There's something called Scratch Sheet. Uh, this is where if you do a search, we'll go back to the search, uh, search engine here. Um, I will do current year because that's uh, what's gonna work. You can't do this for prior years. I'm gonna do a search in the US and I'm just gonna do a general search. These are all the boats that are currently have um, valid certificates uh, in the US. And if I wanted to build a fleet uh, of boats uh, and look and, and build a fleet for a scratch sheet for a race, I tick this box here uh, on the boats. Uh, you always look, by the way, sometimes, uh, and maybe you can explain this to uh, Nathan, sometimes there are boats uh, in here, like here with Currencia. Why are they in here twice? Sorry, I didn't mean that as a trick question, but they've got that different one's actually, reference numbers. That one's pretty simple. Oh, okay, that one's simple. We got club Double-handed and a regular certificate. That's an easy explanation. You had me stumped <laughs> for a second though. Great, th th thanks for that. But, but you know what I mean? Sometimes uh, you see the same boat in this uh, search, or maybe you don't go through here as often as I do, but sometimes you'll see the same boat in here twice. Um, it could be that, that a boat um, ran a certificate early on and then changed their configuration. Uh, and they would still be in this search list. Is that correct? That's correct. Because this looks at every run of the that's submitted to the ORC. And so if you've submitted an amendment or if in my reviewing the final certificate, I found an issue and didn't retract it yet, uh, you can sometimes see a couple of uh, certificates per boat. Okay. Um, so what you want to do, uh, because this is on a timeline of the most recent is up here at the top of the list <clears throat> and the issue date is here. So this this uh, jazz fish, uh, Freedom 35, was just issued a club certificate uh, today, the 13th of April. Uh, so if you see the same boat on this list, you wanna make sure you get the, the latest one um, it, whenever you're building scratch sheets or looking at certificate copies. In any case, uh, if you're building a fleet, you can use this clever tool by clicking that little button there um, and, and doing that throughout a fleet, you can create a scratch sheet now, this is one of the classes that sailed uh, probably the last distance race in the US <laughs> um, so far this year. This was uh, last, well, 
three weeks ago, I guess, right? The maybe four, uh, the race over to Eleuthera um, from Miami. And this was uh, class A. These boats were all uh, entered in that class and we created a scratch sheet. And what's clever now is we can choose the scoring model that the organizers are going to use uh, for that race and create a scratch sheet for it. Now, I happen to know that most of that race was upwind, and so the organizers decided to use a predominant upwind time on time scoring model. So if we select that, uh, this uh, all the, the VPP is run for all these boats because they have valid certificates. The data is known, it's in the database. And by kicking on that, we can now create a scratch sheet for that class of four boats. We can choose uh, the fastest boat if we like as the uh, scratch boat. And by kicking on that button, we now get the time deltas on uh, time allowances based on the elapsed time of the race. Now, this uh, by default is from one minute to 300 minutes. So uh, five hours of time. Uh, you can, what's cool though, is you can edit this so that it becomes more relevant for an offshore race like, like they had last month. So I'll go to one hour, we'll go to uh, what? Let's go to six hours. Uh, so 360 minutes. And if we go 12 hours, that's 720 minutes. Um, if we go to 24 hours, that's 1440 minutes. Um, so by editing these elapsed times here, you can come up with the calculations automatically. This is a HTML file. Um, organizers can make, hopefully make this available for you or what we've done, uh, uh, work with organizers also to uh, freeze these, at, at freeze this table in a PDF and then send it to everybody. And at least then they have the time allowances relative to each other. Um, on this scoring model. So that, that's a clever tool you can use with, uh, with Sailor Services. Um, I'm going to, what else do we have here? Um, that's the buy credit uh, page where you can buy these blocks of credits. The more you buy, the better discount you get. Um, and uh, we've had to add VAT on there, but you uh, don't try to claim that back <laughs> we don't have a facility for that in our system, but uh, hopefully uh, th this is easy enough to use with a variety of different payment methods. Um, okay, uh, I know we're, we're about an hour. Can we keep going, Nathan? Is that okay? Oh, I wanted to go back to the PowerPoint. I think, yes, um, we can keep going. I think we should probably try and move things along a little bit. Yep, okay. We'll, uh, we'll do that now. I'm gonna come back to my... Uh, PowerPoint. And um, okay, so we went through the club certificate. Uh, we have gone through sailor services. Um, just a, uh, I'm going to show another example here on scoring types because I think this is the real power of the VPP based, um, real power of VPP based uh, rating rules is the fact that the, as the uh, conditions change, the, rating, uh, the ratings change, and that just gives you a more accurate uh, uh, ability to rate the boats fairly. Um, Dobbs, just yes. before we go a little bit further into this, I'm seeing one of the first questions that's uh, prompt here is that uh, sure. from Susie Leach, do the scratch sheets require credits to run? Uh, scratch, no, the answer is no. If, if all the boats, uh, no, that's a, not a paid product. But thanks for that question. Excellent question, Susie. Um, and uh, this, yeah, so on the simple scoring box that, that's on every ORC certificate, except for double-handed, they have different, uh, different scoring boxes. Um, you basically have windward lured or coastal long distance. Now, if you opt for a single number for those, uh, the windward lured number is, needs not only uh, wind angles, um, but it also needs wind speed. So for a single number, this is condensed to eight, 12 and 16 knots in this percentage mix. And on the coastal long distance course, it's uh, broken up into these uh, percentage mixes where 
the less wind, the more VMG sailing there is. So that's why it was a higher percentage of beat VMG and run VMG in, in the lighter winds, eight knots. And as the wind speed goes up, it's, it starts to uh, 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 smooth out in its percentage uh, mix um, for, for these typical course types, uh, coastal long distance. We used to call this offshore, but, uh, but really that, that got misleading because uh, sometimes you're sailing courses like this and you're not offshore, you're just racing around a lake or you're racing around the, the bay or something. In any case, uh, with single numbers, and we're looking at two example boat types here, I chose a FAR 30 in one design trim um, and a Beneteau 40.7. Uh, there are a handful of one design class certificates. Uh, these are listed on the ORC website and you can also inquire from Nathan uh, when you're applying for a club certificate. Uh, just make note that you're in one design trim and Nathan will know to look at that, Nathan and Rex. Um, so that, that helps him out on refining uh, what dimensions are needed. Uh, and for Beneteau, and it turns out with these two boat types, they're often rated about the same in a single number system like, like PHRF. So I thought it'd be useful to, to, to just demonstrate some real differences uh, in performance. Using the single number um, on a coastal long distance course, the delta between the two is 5.3 seconds per mile with, uh, remember lower numbers and time on distance means faster speeds. These by the way, are all convertible to time on time. So uh, everything you see in here can be done on time on time. I'm using time on distance simply because I think uh, here in the US culture, a lot, most of our audience still um, uh, has time on distance as kind of a default way that they think about ratings. So 5.3 seconds a mile uh, is a difference between these two boat types. And uh, when you go to the windward lured course option, that, that's uh, compressed down to about 1.9 seconds per mile. However, and this is what's uh, really important, <coughs> excuse me, is, um, is when you plot out across these, uh, the entire range of the VPP from six knots to 20 knots on the windward lured course model, you get these curves. And these, these curves represent the performance of the boat across that wind range. The vertical axis here is boat speed, but it's expressed in seconds per mile. So slower speeds up here, faster speeds down here. You can convert these to knots if you like, but, but for now we're, we're using seconds per mile because that's our usual uh, rating expressions. And you can see that in, in the lightest wind, six knots, that speed delta range is 53 seconds a mile between a FAR 30 and a, and a first 40.7. Um, and then, you know, that compresses down to crossing over to being at zero here in 11 knots. And then uh, it goes the other way to where the um, uh, Beneteau is faster in 20 knots of wind of 17 seconds per mile. So that's a huge range. And, and that begs the question, how can a single number be fair when you see these kinds of rating deltas uh, across the board? So VPP-based system uh, can help solve that and still keep it in a simple format. So ORC uh, developed this triple number system. Oh, I wanna say probably eight, nine years ago, I think. Uh, and it was developed in Holland in, in the Netherlands uh, because they wanted a hybrid between a simplified single number system and something that goes to the full extent of uh, PCS scoring um, where they basically group the wind ranges into low, medium and high wind range for the two course models. And when you do the deltas here, you get a little more refinement of, uh, of what the rating differences are between these two very different boat types. So, and the, uh, actually, I'll just focus on windward lured for now because we're running short on time, but 42.6 seconds per mile in the low range crosses over to actually zero in medium winds. And then uh, 3.6 seconds per mile is what the Beneteau uh, rates faster than the FAR 30. Um, plotting this out, and this is a, looks a little complicated, but, but uh, hopefully I can step you through it. Uh, this is the using triple number system groups the wind range from six to 20 knots into these set segments. So low is 50% six knots, uh, six knots of wind and 50% eight knots of wind. Medium spreads this out wider from eight to 14 knots in these percentages. And then high, high range 
uh, spreads it out between 14 and 20 knots in those percentages. So that's the course model that's used for, um, for the uh, windward leeward uh, course model, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, over these wind ranges. And using that, we can now depict what these ranges are overlaid on, this, on these two performance curves for these two boat types. So low range, six to eight knots of wind. Um, I, I try to dimensionalize the vertical width of the or height of this arrow corresponding to what the, what the two ratings are for these two boats. And there's, so it's a pretty big delta right here in the low range. Uh, I think it was 42 seconds per mile. Whereas here in the medium range, it crosses over to be zero. Uh, so the boats rate exactly the same. And then in the high range, the Beneteau rates slightly faster at 3.6 seconds per mile. So um, I'm hoping that this graphic uh, helps explain how triple number works uh, quantitatively. Um, do I have any questions with this, Nathan, before I try to sum it up or do we get any? Not any yet. Other, Susie? <laughs> not yet on this. We've got some other questions that have come through uh, a little okay. ahead of time, um, but not on this topic specifically. Okay. Um, I'll finish out the PowerPoint then, and when, then we can come to questions uh, with this plug. The, the ORC IRC World Championship is happening in Newport at the New York Yacht Club at the end of September, so we uh, should be back in business by then for sure. I want to just uh, give a strong plug for this because there has not been a World Championship in this kind of sailing, big boat, handicap racing, for 20 years. Um, you know, 20 years ago in the year 2000, there was a IMS Worlds, uh, it had 34 boats. Um, we've got well more than that, actually 50% more than that signed up right now. Uh, expect to have more. So I, I want, uh, if there's any boat owners out there interested in, in participating in this, in this unique event, I really urge you to look into it. Um, there's a website for it. It's on the New York Yacht Club site or as a link off the ORC site, have a look. It's six, uh, six races of uh, inshore races and two races of uh, short short offshore and, and a longer offshore race. It's a, it's a week of competitive sailing and uh, certainly a lot of fun. Um, in that event, we hope to have uh, the Sailing Yacht Research Foundation has been working uh, uh, on, a, on an app. Um, we didn't have time today to talk about performance curve scoring. That's the most accurate type of scoring available with BPP systems. Um, and uh, uh, Larry Rosenfeld at SURF has been spearheading an effort to create an app for this. I know there's an app for everything, but uh, this is quite a good one. Uh, and we hope to have it rolling out uh, later this summer, uh, hopefully a beta, beta testing this summer for use in the worlds. That's our, that's our goal. Uh, and now time for questions. All right, so uh, starting up back towards the top of the list, David Johnson is asking if you could spend just a moment just discussing what CDL is. Ah, CDL, good question. Um, I, I'm not gonna bring up its definition on the website. I'll just uh, explain it um, uh, qualitatively. Um, CDL basically looks at uh, the performance potential of a boat skewed heavily towards upwind performance in 12 knots of wind. Uh, we needed a tool other than GPH, general purpose handicap, which is a, a mix of, 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 of ratings uh, balance between upwind and downwind uh, and reaching angles. Uh, we needed something a little more sophisticated for the windward leeward races um, because we started seeing a trend toward boats that were optimizing their upwind performance uh, for their GPH rating um, at the expense of their downwind performance because all windward lured races start upwind. So you get a huge advantage initially if you have a, a, a boat that's, that performs strongly upwind in the first leg of the race, then they can then just kind of hang on uh, and not be rated fast on the downwind legs. Um, also time on time, you proportionally spend a lot more time going upwind. So the CDL was invented as a way to uh, uh, evaluate the upwind performance potential of a boat in and around 12 knots of wind. And, and we now use that as a, uh, as a tool to split the championship. And this is, this is only used as championship, although I'm told that uh, in Italy and other, uh, let's say, uh, uh, more uh, populated ORC markets, uh, that they, uh, they use CDL to define their, 
their national class splits as well. So at the championships, we define class A, class B, and class C um, by, uh, by these CDLs. Great. Um, we've got Gary Knackman asking, what is the cost difference between an ORC club certificate and a PHRF certificate? And how would you suggest getting your yacht club to change systems? <laughs> well, the first question I can't answer because I don't know PHRF is, I don't know. Uh, it varies with each PHRF fleet, I believe. And I think the prices range from probably 50 to 100 bucks, something like that. Um, you would know better than I would, Nathan, on that one. Um, <clears throat> ORC club certificates uh, are pegged at $100. Um, and uh, that's actually uh, quite a discounted rate uh, that we work with closely with Nathan and his office to uh, offer. Um, and we have other incentives actually that we do with race organizers. So right now we have a promotion going with um, the folks uh, doing uh, the American Yacht Club Spring Series. Uh, hopefully it'll happen, but we have a promotional discount with them that, so that anybody with an IRC certificate can get a free ORC certificate. Uh, likewise for the uh, Storm Trisel, <clears throat> Storm Trisel Club's uh, uh, Block Island race. And then uh, I think we'll do this later in the Vineyard race as well, um, that anybody with an uh, uh, IRC certificate can get an ORC certificate, club certificate for free. Uh, and finally, the other promotion we have going is with the um, New York Yacht Club, uh, it, it, the, the Yacht Club Cruise uh, for their annual cruise. Uh, there's a promotion going there for, uh, for free ORC club certificates. Uh, we're happy to work with race organizers to do promotional, excuse me, promotional deals if the, if the fit is right. And we work closely with Nathan uh, uh, on being able to make those offers. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, sorry, what was the other part uh, of that question? I think you covered that all actually. Um, and then getting fleets, yeah, getting fleets to switch over to ORC. Uh, contact, <laughs> that's, that's a, a very uh, tough question and a complex one. Uh, contact me at usa at orc.org. Uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to uh, converse with, with people about that. I had a long conversation the other day with uh, uh, an organizer with a Midwest fleet in one of the Great Lakes. Um, but, but this is, yeah, this is a, a long conversation and we have to find the right fits. Great. Um, question that comes from a race administration side of things. If the a race is running for approximately 100 miles, uh, do you have a suggestion on what sort of wind mixes to use or if they should just use the medium coastal distance? What's, what's the best fit, do you believe? Um, <clears throat> that's tricky. Uh, if you're in some place like, you know, trade winds and you've got uh, reasonable assurance that, that the weather conditions are going to be, uh, uh, you know, uniform over that period of time, you can try one of those uh, wind ranges. Um, uh, you also have to look at your fleet size and, uh, over the course of a hundred miles, you know, a TP 52, uh, can do that in, you know, 10, 10 hours. Uh, whereas it'll take twice that long with, uh, with, with smaller, slower boats. Uh, uh personally, I think, and, and through our experience, um, in doing hundred mile races in the ORC championships, we typically, uh, don't like to, to peg it to a particular wind band. Uh, we generally use the single number uh, for that, the uh, what's called offshore single number. And uh, I think earlier in my presentation, I showed you the matrix for that, but, but that's usually the best bet. Now we have had that one refinement that I showed in the double-handed certificate of predominantly upwind and predominantly downwind. Um, so if you think of uh, the Mac race does this, they have a, a, a predominantly upwind, predominantly downwind and an all-purpose. So we do have those three options available. Um, and if as a race organizer, you have a weather pattern that is for the entire duration of the race for everybody in the fleet, you don't wanna bias somebody uh, if you can help it. Uh, I would say we could safely offer those three options. Great, thank you, Dubs. Mm -hmm. um, probably time for one or two more. Um, so the question that I have here is, uh, do I have to have a boat with an ORC certificate in order to access the sailor services portal? Uh, the answer is no. Anybody can register. 
we've got tens of thousands of people actually registered in this in this uh, system. Um, not all of them are boat owners. Some of them are even industry people that are looking at uh, sail dimensions or rig dimensions. Uh, you can be uh, uh, somebody who's you know interested in knowing you're, you're considering buying a boat. You're considering buying a boat type and you wanna know more about its performance. Um, <clears throat> use sailor services to go do a search on that boat type. Hunt around, uh, it is absolutely not required. Um, one thing I wanted to mention in that 40.7 and uh, <clears throat> FAR 30 uh, comparison study that we just did, use that as a tool if you're a PHRF <laughs> sailor and you're unhappy with your rating, <clears throat> there's some pretty powerful tools available for you to, to argue your case in an appeal uh, based on what's available in sailor services. Great. Uh, all right, and then one from Christopher Benzak. Uh, can you speak to the number of crew on a club certificate? How does ORC manage declared number of crew? Good question. There's a long formula for that. <laughs> and once again, I'm not gonna bring up the VPP documentation to show you uh, what that formula is, but, but it, was, it was devised probably many years ago uh, based on um, uh, the boat size, the boat displacement, uh, so uh, a there's a variety of different factors that go into that. It's more or less uh, roughly equivalent to uh, what I think the IRC parameters are, which is a, a number of crew. Uh, and we, we've interchanged that with IRC uh, to be consistent on the 85 kilo um, uh, metric of, of what an individual crew weighs. Um, Nathan, maybe you can speak to that too, I, uh, but it's, it's, it's more or less the same as IRC. Now, I don't know about PHRF limits and where they are, um, and I'm not sure how those are determined. The only other thing I would add, Dobbs, is that crew weight on an ORC certificate is uh, absolutely declarable. So if you know you're going to be racing with 12 guys and you know that they all race about 180 pounds, declare that. Um, remember, it's a value that's do not exceed. There is a minimum number on an I ORC certificate. Uh, but that's only enacted if the race committee or if the notice of race has uh, specified that. Yes, and, and, and that's an important point. Thanks for mentioning it, Nathan, is if you're um, racing a boat that uh, has a default crew weight that, you know, is, is higher than who you normally sail with, absolutely declare the lower number because um, almost all boats will rate faster because they're, they're upwind going to go faster if they have more crew. Uh, it's just the physics of, of how most of these boats work. Um, so yeah, the advice for sure is, is if you're generally sailing with less crew, um, use a declared number that is less than the default. All right. Um, probably time for one or two more. Uh, James Huff is asking, can the rating times change after completing the race to document the correct wind and other conditions? So I think he's asking about post-race scoring. That's an excellent question. Um, we try not to do post-race scoring. Uh, the ORC rating rules in section 400, I believe, uh, outlines how, um, how a triple number works, how single number works, and how the various uh, rating options work. Uh, the guidance that we give there is that if a race committee on a, on a inshore race of whatever length, or no, let's say, if they're comfortable enough to choose one of the uh, triple number uh, uh, choices, low, medium, or high, um, they have the option, if there's been a, quote, significant change in conditions, to change that uh, to one of the other options or go to a single number if it looks like it's totally randomized. Um, but they really need to do that um, before they publish results. They, they need to... Uh, when they get to publishing results as even preliminary, uh, they, they, they should use the option that they've switched to. They, they should not publish results and then come back and change them later. All right. Well, thank you, Dobbs. Um, thank you to the viewers for turning in. If you want to see more from Dobbs and the ORC, feel free to, out to, feel free to reach him at that email address of usa at orc.org. And also be sure to check the website, orc.org, and that's where the Sailor Services Portal today. 
If you've enjoyed today's session, please support our efforts to build a community of active and engaged sailors through the Starboard Portal by purchasing or renewing your US Sailing membership. We have a lot of great content coming up on the schedule, so thanks to US Sailing members, we're able to adapt and evolve better to better serve sailors with uh, content like this one. Visit uh, ussailing.org slash membership to join or renew your membership today. Thanks again and have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone for tuning in.